Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome everybody to today's conversation with um, artist Glenda Leon. Glenda, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, and it will be um, moderated by um, our exhibition curator, the curator of the, the current online exhibition that we have of Glenda's work, um, uh, Patricia Ortega Miranda. Patricia, welcome. And then finally, I want to, sorry, as I'm scrolling through my list of things here, um, I want to give a shout out to um, Professor uh, Shannon Hollis, who unfortunately cannot make it today, but um, sends her, her warm wishes and, and, and all the best to her uh, students who are here, who will be um, assisting Patricia with moderating. And these are the students from um, uh, Art 488, which is the uh, honor studio. So welcome to all the students. Um, before we kind of dive in and, and, and um, have Patisa kind of uh, take over, um, I do just want to remind everybody that um, we are recording this. We're recording this just for the purpose of um, archiving and um, to post later on our YouTube channel in case anybody is, is, is unable to make it today. They can go back and see it later. Um, the only ground rule that I have is to please just keep your mic muted um, unless you're you're asked to speak um, it's a nice small group so it's much more manageable than like a huge large format webinar but you never know maybe people may be joining us later and so it's just you know for the purpose of crowd control um, I just ask that everybody keep their their mics off and, until you're called on and, and to speak um, other than that um, I want to you know welcome everybody here and kind of hand everything over to Patricia Patricia please Thank you, Thras, um, and uh, thank you all for being here. I, I am going to introduce uh, Glenda Leon to all of you, um, and I hope you all uh, present here had the chance to look at the exhibition, Breath and Delirium, which is going to be closing uh, very soon, in about two weeks, right, Thras? Yes. So um, if you have not yet uh, taken a look at it, I encourage you all to do it. And um, I'm going to introduce Glenda, but um, so when I told Glenda that I wanted to do this introduction, I told her that I didn't want to do just like a regular introduction where I just talk about all the places where she, she's shown her work and all the collections that uh, own her work and that I wanted to do something a little bit different. And so we, uh, we got into this conversation and this was what um, came out of it. Glenda was a precocious child. She was only three years old when she learned to read and write with the help of her maternal grandmother. By the time she was 15, she had already gotten a hold of Frederick Nietzsche's book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra and had read Dostoevsky's fantastic short novel, A Faint Heart. While still in middle school, she choreographed a dance piece for her and some of her friends, impressing a walker by who arranged for Glenda to get an audition at the ballet school. She grew up in El Vedado, one of the culturally richest areas of Havana City. If you walk down Linea Street, you will find a theater house, a bookstore, a museum, a gallery, a cultural center, a cafeteria or a bar every few blocks. And on 23rd Street alone, there are so many movie theaters that during the film festival, there's no way you can watch a full film at each place in one day. Glenda told me that she was a freaky which is how you will call during the 80s and 90s young people who like to listen to death metal and hang out at parks or places that were not controlled by institutions. Really an urban subculture with a radical approach to music and life that contested static notions of national culture and reacted against the government's official cultural policies. Glenda studied philology and later our history. And her thesis, La Condición Performática, The Performatic Condition, has been published in Spanish and in French. Glenda lives 
in Madrid, Spain, but has yet to leave Cuba. So let's welcome her to Maryland through this virtual window that allowed us also to enter her work and her universe. Glenda, thank you so much for being here with us today. And thank you to Teras Matla for making this event possible and to all the students for being here. I know you all came uh, prepared with wonderful questions and I want to mention, mention that those people from the audience who would like to ask questions, um, Teraz will be uh, keeping track of the chat and you can please post your questions on the chat because um, we will integrate them and maybe Glenda can respond to them at the end um, of the conversation with the students after that. Um, so I wanted to start the conversation asking Glenda to share with us how this somewhat oblique trajectory into art as a practice unfolded through her life in Cuba and beyond. So Glenda, if you can share a little bit with us, how was that? Well, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Patricia and Taras for the great invitation. And I think the, the, the best of it is the spontaneity of you know, to of the whole project to respond to, to respond to the to the situation, and with particularly this this work. I mean, I think this this is what uh, what is more important uh, about this project. So thank you, and for the great introduction, Patricia. <laughs> um, well, the, as you just said, uh, my my form my education in Cuba was very. Uh, you know, uh, open. I was very uh, curious. I was wanted to be a choreographer since I was a child. I was dancing and um, and making choreographies, uh, improvising, I practiced ballet since I was like uh, five years old, six years old, and and that it was evolving in, in parallel with the with the kind of uh, intellectual curiosity, you know. Also, because my mom studied art history. And she's also um, a film. She was also a film, uh, film editor in the film industry, and uh, she's retired now. But she took me there with her to to the to the old, you know, uh, rooms of editing, which was before it was manual. You know, uh, it's called Moviola, and it's kind of, it's these big machines to edit with the film. You know, maybe you watch some of them. Hear some. You know, you know about it. And I was staying there a lot because she sometimes she, she was taking with me with her to her job. So I think that's part of my education in a way because it was so natural because she was even asking me to help her editing by pasting, you know, the, the tapes and things like that. So uh, I think that created in me a kind of a natural uh, editing sensitivity, if I can say so. So I know how to how when, when a, a, a sequence is telling you stop, don't show me anymore, like cut here or show this. And, and it's because since three years old, I'm, 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 I'm seeing it, you know. I'm, so, and, and living also with an editor, it's amazing because it's kind of a hassle. It's not so nice because uh, when you watch a film, it's all the time like, oh, how bad is this? This is a mistake. This is, the, this is bad. And I was like, oh, mom, can you shut up? Let me watch the film, enjoy it. But then I learned, I realized after all these years, I know what is wrong, you know, <laughs> in the film. So, you know, these kind of things you, you don't know, but you are learning. And of course, even as, as you said, with the, you know, uh, like a, a rocker gave me a, this book and, and when I was 50 years old, Nietzsche. You know, he opened the door to, for me. So since then, I read all the Nietzsche's books, you know, and and it's kind of this, you know, unavoidable things, uh, um, not uh, unexpected things that you find in life, which teach you also. And in the academy, you want so sorry, you want to say something, Patricia? Yeah, no, I just want yeah, no, I just wanted to say that. Um, just to ask you a little bit, uh, what you had told me, well, I think you were gonna, you, you were about to jump into that now, mm -hmm. about how you arrived to Anna and how you started going to um, yeah. classes. Yeah. yeah. 
Yes, uh, in academic, well, I, I study um, I study art history uh, after doing philology, as you said, but I never, I never studied at, at the High Institute of Art, like um, as it's called, uh, officially. So what I did was when I was doing my thesis, the La Condición Performática, the Performatic Condition, I approached to a group of students who, uh, who were doing a lot of performances at the, at the time in the streets, and it was kind of like, you know, what everybody was talking about in Havana. And I really liked what they were doing. And so I, I went to the school and I interviewed some of them. I, I got into their studios and, and by talking to them, they, a couple of them told me, well, you, you, you are, you're describing a work of art because I was, we were sharing ideas. So they, he said, do it with us. I was like, no, no, I'm not like, because I, I already had studied art, visual art when I was 12 years old and I hated academy I hated drawing and I, so I left it to, to be in dance so but I almost graduated from that school and it was a big base for me like a, like the ba the basics I learned it there so I said no no I don't want to come back to draw and to draw again models oh, I hate that and they were like laughing oh, we don't do that anymore here in the University of Art so what are you saying we were we doing performance installations things like that and say so I said well okay so I joined this famous group, and it was called DUP. From a, it's the translation is from a pragmatic pedagogic, uh, and it, it was really an important group in, in Cuba and very influence, influencing uh, other students. And since then, other people created groups, other other school, other, other groups, uh, other students groups. And, uh, but there was, even we went, we win uh, a UNESCO prize in 2020, in 2000, in 2000. So that's it, that's it, what you wanted, uh, you were asking? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's it. Um, no, I, I, I know that you uh, work with Rene, uh, right? Exactly. That you were telling me. So um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more uh, what will happen in a class with Rene. Ah, uh, yeah. Exactly. Just for the people who don't know, it's uh, one of the artists that is central to the uh, performance art uh, movement or phenomena, we can call it, in Cuba during the 80s and the 90s, and uh, really uh, was a professor at the uh, Institute of Art in Cuba, in Havana, and was kind of the, 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 the spark or who sparked this, uh, all these different groups and movements that came out of it because it's not only goop, but it's also, uh, I mean, you had Art de Calle and you have many other, right, yeah. of these mm -hmm. different uh, groups, so yeah. Yes, sure, yes. Uh, René Francisco was the teacher, the professor, the leader of this group of students. And he's very good, he's very well known for guiding the, for guiding the, the student in knowing uh, what is her, his best skill or her best skill and like saying, you know, go this way. So th he's very good. And he, and so at the time that I joined this group, I also joined his classes at this university. So I remember uh, one of the things I like more, especially after traveling and living and studying, because after that, I studied a master in Cologne, in New Media. And um, in the East Side, the High Institute of Art in Havana, when the, there were special se uh, sections, ses sessions, where the students were showing what they were doing, their works. And, and to these classes were invited everybody in the school. So if you were in first year, the people from fifth year could join. And the critics were so, so aggressive. But at the time, you could be crying, you could be uh, you know, uh, screaming, yelling, uh, fighting. But when the years passed, you realize how good is this? Because if you don't have this critical approach, as I saw after in Cologne, in Germany, in this school of visual art where everybody was saying, oh, this is so interesting. Oh, this is so nice. Oh, yeah. and, and it was really bad, honestly. And you know, of course you don't have to harm people, but you have to say, hey, you know, why don't you look another way? <laughs> you know, maybe this is more interesting. Because if you, you say you're not honest, you are damaging this person because you're not helping them. And I think in, in 
this is very youth. Uh, I also have found it in Canada, maybe in the United States, it's like that as well. But people don't dare to be direct. And I think this is not, you know, this is not helping. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I think this is a great way then to break it uh, and bring the students in um, since they already uh, heard a little bit of um, kind of your upbringing um, mm -hmm. and your indirect oblique entrance into art. Um, I, I posted the order. So I think it's Kira, the first one. So Kira, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. Uh, Glenda, it's an honor to be able to um, like be here and, and like really just pick your brain about your process. So um, I don't know, I have a few questions. I was trying to figure out which one, you know, felt like most right. But um, when I was reviewing your website, there I noticed a lot of motifs that are like recurring throughout your work. Um, so, you know, the use of butterflies in particular, human features like hair and and like acrylic nails and teeth. Um, so I just wanted to know, like, do those things have particular meaning to you and, and do they all relate to each other in a way in your mind to like your body of work as a whole? Like, is there a particular like reason that you work with these things specifically? Yes, thank you. It's an honor for me as well to be with you. <laughs> With all of you. Uh, yes, the, the materials are intentionally chosen, uh, of course. They have uh, this famous uh, me, uh, sentence, uh, the, the medium is the message. He was referred by my Luga, Mac Luga, Luga. It was referred to the, new, to the media or like this, but I, I also uh, use it as the media of, of the material, you know. So, the message is also contained there in the material. So I like they are most of them are discard discard some of them are discarded like um, like the hairs and uh, and uh, and the, or the hairs for example and the chewing gum that I use as well already chewed or chewing gum. So I like this is like for example this kind of materials is as at the time that I use it is a gesture. A gesture of empowering, um, of like trying you to imagine something kind of sublime from a discarded of the toilet elevated. And, and I think it's kind of optimistic because sometimes people say, oh, I cannot do art because it's so expensive, or I cannot do this because it's that. So it's kind of saying, hey, whatever you have in hand, it, you know, you can do, you can create a new world with that. It's kind of like an optimistic message, you know. So, also, probably a way to get out of this uh, traditional academic, you know, drawing that I hated so much. So instead of uh, drawing with a pen, which is over a pencil, which is I'm doing a little bit now with the uh, with the pandemic and things like that, and, and after um, over, uh, so, you know, like uh, getting over of this trauma, you know, <laughs> of, the, of the drawing, academic drawing. But, but it's also no, another way to, you know, to add, a, to, to, to make something new. Because actually, I think in, the, in art history, it's very important to add something new. And, and, and it's not impossible. So people say, oh, it's nothing. You cannot add anything new to this work. Why? It's not true. <laughs> because, you know, there is, there, is a, there is a book that I really recommend you all. And it's, it's not, I don't know how it is in the United States. Actually, I wrote it, I, I think I, I, I read it in English. And it's George Kubler. Uh, it's called, uh, George Kubler, the, the, the Shapes of Time. It's called the book. And in this, this is a wonderful book. For, it's a kind of very new approach to our history, a different approach to our history. And he defined the artistic invention as this. It's just the, the mix of two already known objects, but create a new one. So imagine how many combinations you have or already new things to create, an, uh, already old things to create a new one. And so, and, and, the, and the, the nails, uh, of course, is uh, a, a, a connection with femininity but with fake beauty also as well. Now, it's kind of like an ironic, you know, critic and, and kind of take it, a critic and not, like kind of ironic commentary, not, not even a critic, 
but kind of uh, taking it, you know, because for example, with the nails, um, uh, I, you know, it's kind of a critique to, to those women uh, who think that by enlarging their beauty or uh, exaggerating their beauty, they're gonna get the men, you know, it's kind of like, so it's, it's kind of this thing, you know, like the target of getting it. So without, with the fake beauty, which is kind of uh, silly because someday you have to face the men with your reality. <laughs> you will know what you really are, you know, without the nails, the eyelashes and, <laughs> and the makeup. <laughs> so, um, and, and which other material, the teeth, well, you know, I think it's, and the model, the butterflies, the, the, the butterflies drawings and paintings I've done. It's also because when I, I, what I have done with them is kind of a huge galactic uh, and cosmic uh, landscapes. And, and of course, this, the, the choice of using a butterf the butterfly's wings dust is to make this kind of relationship between the microscopic and the macroscopic. And also, I'm very interested in, in questioning the, prepo the pre prepoten prepotencia, the, um, you know, like the, 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 the situation, the position that the human, the, the, the human being has uh, placed themselves regarding nature which is, you know, like very aggressive and I'm beyond, I'm, I'm beyond this, I'm over this, I, I, can, I can control it. And to, to have the opposite, you know, to have, you know, to make the butterfly wings a huge, a huge uh, word with it, to make it with it, you know, kind of like that. <laughs> I hope Thank I answer your questions. <laughs> Thank you, Glenda. The anthropocentric you're thinking exactly. about. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you, uh, Kira, for your great question. I think it's uh, uh, Candice, could it be, be? Yeah? Hi, Candice. <laughs> I thought that was so interesting, how you like didn't like art in the beginning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like drawing like as an artist. I feel like that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a question about how, so I've noticed how like your videos, they're kind of like far apart dated far apart did you like plan to like make them as time went through or like was it like a long process when you're making it or was it like you kind of thought of it at this moment and then you wanted to make it uh i i wanted to understand the butterflies falling apart that's what you meant no mm -hmm. or, like mm -hmm. yeah breathe and delirium that the whole thing uh glenda i think she she says that the videos themselves are made at different times during different uh, uh, different years and yes. how kind of you know you work through uh, them uh, well, that time. So. she was uh, what, what you were going to um uh, Candice was going to say uh like, like you make them through a very long time period did you plan that or was it like at the moment uh, you wanted to make this and then you make the other one and then you made it that one okay but you mean the because there is some videos that i put for example 2008 uh slash 2016 mm -hmm. this is what you mean or mm -hmm. or each individual video um i the whole thing ah I don't know if I understand the question. <laughs> so I, I just made it in different times. So, uh, but, but they are, because there is a, there is a line that there is a kind of uh, interest in common in them. For example, the breathing that I've been using, doing different videos with breathing. For example, with hair, it happens the same. I have used the hair in 2000, uh, the first, you know, first things I did almost. But I'm still using it because it's kind of my pencil, you know. I, sometimes I have ideas for it, and I oh, this is perfect with hair, and it still is there. And I, I think with the breathing, it's also like that. But I don't know if this is what you mean. Then did it kind of change over time, like what you plan to do, or like like the whole your interest? Did it kind of change over time? Of course, of course, because of the experiences, yes. The, every time I have an, a new experience, uh, 
I I have I if I cons I consider myself that I like to experience things so that I go you know kind of far kind of far away and I'm not afraid of things when I'm curious so this allow me to make works of art because if I'm just reading books I don't think I will have half of my work done. It's because of the experience I had in life and my curiosity who have uh, brought me to do things despite the danger <laughs> of it, the possible danger. I never thought uh, of, of it. So um, these videos are caused by, are, uh, are actually, um, uh, you know, up to this experience, yes. A special experience, of, sometimes spiritual experiences, you know, in a way. And uh, so, yeah, they have, they have been very intense and I have uh, put it in videos and I hope it transmits at least a little bit of what I have experienced. And, uh, but yes, in spite of all that, uh, that I, they were done even like 10 or more than 10 years ago, they're so actual now. They are so, you know, uh, with the times of reading. I mean, I think the sign of our times now with this coronavirus, it's so obvious, like, you know, in coronavirus and, and what happened in the United States with the, asphyxiate, the police asphyxiating people, you know, this is kind of focus on breathing, you <laughs> kind of, you know, every, everything is uh, about that in a way. Um, I, I wanted just to say that uh, to Candice that I thought it was a, this was a great question because uh, we are, you, we think that artists just kind of come up with ideas and then they work on those ideas and they then move on and that's it and kind of uh, work with something else. And I think that what Glenda is sharing is that these are uh, kind of motifs or themes or that reappear in her work because she doesn't stop exploring them, right? That she mm -hmm. kind of continues to uh, use them as she kind of experiences new things and thinks about them again, right? So great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, wh who is, uh, I don't have the list here, but whoever is next can just jump in. Jasmine says. Jasmine. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I guess my question you kind of already touched on, but I was really fascinated with the idea of breath and how it represents fragility of like the human nature. Um, I do a lot of paintings on um, the human relationship with the earth and how we reflect off one another. And I was curious if you thought the breathing was supposed to be a negative, like if you thought putting our breath into the earth was showing how mortal we are or if it was supposed to be like a universal symbol of life that we should see ourselves in the earth itself or just where your mindset was when you were like intertwining those two things yes it's it, yes thank you for your question and it's more it's more like what you said um the last the last thing it's about it's not about negative um it, it's not well at the end, depends. Depends. It depends on what you want to see because it, it has a negative part of what we are doing to the airs, of course. But therefore, I don't want to stay in that negative part. I want to go beyond and say, okay, this is what we have done, and and but this is what is the, for me the truth that we are part of the nature. And if you breathe, if you can experience a synchronicity with nature, you will, you wouldn't damage it, you know. If you if you really feel it like like the ancient like the the ancient the, the native the native people you know the relationship of the native American you know they do the, it's kind of that 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 uh, wisdom that I want that I want to spread in a way in that experience as well uh, and it's, 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 it's the same if you don't feel it you can read about tolerance you can read about e ecological you know things, but if you don't feel it, maybe you behave well, but you, it's not the same and maybe, you know, it won't last. So, so it's, it's about my, this kind of work is about to spread kind of like a, a sensitivity with towards nature to be, to make you be part of it, you know, and, and, uh, and feel it since uh, this, the same level, not that you are on top of it or, 
feel a part of it. And very interesting, the, the, the Japanese people, um, since not so long ago, didn't have the word nature in their vocabulary. Because, yes, it's amazing. Why? Because they felt that they were part of it. There was nothing apart. There was nothing to call nature. This is beautiful. And this is what I want to, to transmit with this breathing synchronicity, you know, that you are part of it. That, and, and these times are telling you that, you know, we are not divided. We are, the air is the same. We are breathing together in a way, you know. And that's, that's it. That's it. Thank you. Can, can I, I jump just... in too for a second, just kind of building off um, of what, what the students said and all, all the questions have been really great so far. Um, I wanted to point out just one, one thing, um, um, part of kind of um, the, the kind of, I guess, coincidences, you know, that have happened, I guess, you know, um, in, in light of obviously the pandemic, you know, that there is this, you know, coronavirus and the, the way that you kind of um, can possibly breathe in the virus, you know what I mean? And although that was not a part of your thought process when you made the work, you know, it's definitely um, the works help us, I think, better contextualize how important the, the breath is. You know, it's one of these senses that um, we, we take for granted, almost like, you know, like sight and smelling and hearing. Um, these are things that operate um, simultaneously, and we don't really notice it until it's gone, you know, and, and, um, and, and the other kind of coincidences, you know, um, what, what, what was kind of a, a great appeal in, in bringing your work together, especially in, in response to, you know, breath and delirium was um, obviously the, um, uh, um, the George Floyd incidents, you know, where, where um, we had an individual who, who was literally asking to breathe, you know, and that, that, that natural human right was denied to him, you know, and so there are all these contemporary issues that kind of arise when, when looking at your work and not saying that your work was, was created as a response to that, but we can in some ways kind of reattach ourselves, you know, in a contemporary sense to a, an existing form to kind of better understand our moment in time, where we are now in terms of the environment, social justice, race relations, and how important, you know, something as simple as a breath really is to our very existence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree with it, yes. And I'm happy that, 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 that in a way that, that, that my work can, can be, you know, for, can work, can function as, as, a, as a, what you said. And it's, it was done before, but I have, this, this, it happened to me that sometimes I've done, I've done works 10 years ago and, and suddenly it's now when it's, it's more, it, it more uh, understood by people. It's not now that it's very kind of frustrating in a way because I'm like, oh yeah, I did it then. <laughs> but no, um, no, I've been, with this, with this kind of videos, uh, yeah, it's, it's always uh, being uh, well received. And, uh, and this thing, what you said, that we don't, we don't appreciate things until it's gone. So, yes, I think it's, it's, it's actually uh, all the senses of our, you know, are kind of, uh, in, you know, I think that the future is to, to focus on our, our senses because we are, we are forgetting about them, like really touching, really smelling, because not just we are, we are forgetting and also the, the life in the city, it's the, in cities are also not, um, you know, helping to encourage these, these senses. And also now with this, you know, when you breathe with your own CO2, it's really bad with this mask. And, and I think it's kind of also a, a, for the future saying, oh, this is what you would breathe when all this is contaminated. You know, this is how it feels. You will feel dizzy. You will feel bad because you will feel, you know, breathing CO2. And kind of, you know, it's very important the times where you are, you are, how we are passing. And, and I think we're experiencing, and I think for young, young people, like it would be, it's, it's really, I, I see them and I would, because I am, I was very rebelled and I see how they keep the mask. Oh my God, they are, you know, a medal for them, for all of you, because, you know, it's kind of like, and even younger than you, because you're already, you know, already grown up. And but each young people of 12 years and 13 years, how they they do it, you know, to keep their masks 
oh my god you know it's really really terrible but let's keep the questions <laughs> Miguel, I think it's uh, your turn. Hi, Brenda. Thank you for being here. Um, Hi. Um, so for me, your works in this exhibition were- so about... Sorry, Miguel. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I cannot hear you very well. Is there- Volume or something? Or... The volume or something, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is this better? Yes. Better, better. Yes. Yeah, thank okay. you. Um, so for me, your works in this exhibition were about uh, sort of- um, look, engaging the, the mechanisms of, of delirium, sort of uh, like looking at the language of delirium, the form of delirium, how, do deli how, does, how does delirium work? Um, and so um, I guess my question is, you know, are, are deliriums, can, can the state of delirium be a sort of positive thing? You know, for example, are, is your work using or trying to evoke delirium to get us out of our own deliriums, right? Uh, a delirium <laughs> of unity versus a delirium of division. That's wonderful, yes. Um, I mean, uh, I'd like, I like to see my work as a delirium <laughs> as, and to escape the delirium, but I never thought about it, but that's great. <laughs> um, but the, the intention when I was doing it, um, because there are different deliriums. So the first ones were uh, to say what we have already known, that some things appear to be one way, but they, when you get closer, or when you, you, you know, the time shows you that they are in the reality something else. And this is, this is also kind of a symbol, a kind of like allegory to the ego you know, that we project, we project, oh, yes, uh, um, you know, they all hate me, and uh, we pr project that, but it's not real, but then you give this reality so true, that then you, you believe everybody hates you, and you behave like that, but this is your ego, although, because some people say, no, ego is to think you're better, no, 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 ego is whatever your mind is projecting the whole, your whole world, so not, because some people say, no, ego is because I'm feeling better, I'm, I'm best, the best, no, no, no. Also, when you think you're the worst, this is your ego. <laughs> so, um, so this is about that, kind of, uh, I like a lot the, the concept of truth, the truth, kind of a philosophical, I, li I love philosophy, and I kind of like to show the truth, which is, you know, in my videos, this is not the truth. It's the delirium as well, but it's kind of a gesture and it's symbolic as well. You want to, yeah. Thank you. And then I guess um, as a corollary is, um, so breath, right? And just, so I also um, used to dance, right? And so oh. I would get like really nervous if, right <laughs> before a performance, right? It's sort of almost like a state of delirium. And so maybe, <laughs> remembering to breathe sort of broke me out of that and brought me to the present. I don't know, do you think that your engagement of breath is also influenced by your background in dance? To be honest, um, I don't know. I, I, it's not conscious, at least. My, my relationship with, breath, with breath, it has to do with an experience I had, a, let's call it a kind of a spiritual, a, and so um, I, after that experience, I saw the world completely different and, and, uh, and it had to do with, I experienced it, let's say, through the breathing. So the, the breathing was like a bridge for me to experience a new reality that was in this reality. It was not a delirium, it was, it was real. And uh, yes, um, I think it's that. But, but, the, but the dance, the dance uh, background, it, do, it does influence in, my, in the rhythm of the videos, totally. I think uh, they are, the rhythm also has, uh, yeah, it's kind of a choreography that you do through editing. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Milan, I think it's, is Milan here? Yes, there you are. Sorry, I thought it was um, muted. Hi, it's Brenda. All right. Um, so Milan, Milan, I'm sorry. We have the same issue with the volume. Can you okay. get closer <laughs> to the mic? Is working. Hello. Yes. A little better. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. 
right, I'll take it. All right, so upon viewing this exhibition, I and like kind of breathing with you um, while I guess watching the videos, it made me think of the duality of breathing, um, of the fleeting breath and the eternal breath. Um, with the fleeting breath, we each with each breath we take, it comes in and out, and it enters back into never to enter our lungs ever again, probably. Um, and with the eternal breath, we kind of breathe ev like every day of our lives, throughout our entire lives. Um, so I kind of would like to hear your thoughts about the fragility of the ephemeral and the eternal. Thank you, thank you for the question. So you, you think you, you are, you, the, the eternal breathing is for you like uh, one life? Do we stay? Or, yeah, that's nice. Or, like, we pretty much engage in this activity throughout our entire lives, never stopping until um, we pass. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, breathing is actually so interesting because after that experience that I was mentioning to Miguel, right? Yes. Uh, I realized, I practiced yoga, and I realized that even my video was described by the, the, prof, the teacher, the yoga teacher. So, um, uh, so I realized how important was the breathing for, for other cultures, and, and it was, you know, for centuries. And I don't know if you know about this, but the Indians, the, the, the Indian from, from, from India, from, you know, um, they say uh, that you can you can count the life. You can see how how healthy the person is and how long they will live by the kind the kind of breathing they do. I mean that if they breathe fast, they the Indians say they will live not so much. And they compare it with the animals. The animals that breathe, that, that breathe in a fast uh, rhythm. You know, they are short life animals and the animals who sleep, who breathe slow, uh, they live longer. I wonder now myself how, how slow the elephants breathe. <laughs> I've never asked that. I want to, I want to Google that. <laughs> so, um, so this is very important. And also the breathing that is in most of the, in all the videos is called for, you know, Indian is Ujjayi. Ujjayi breathing is the breathing of the of the kind of the victory of the or the of the it's kind of an, el, el vencedor el vencedor the the winner the kind of the winner the winner um, breathing and uh, and yes uh, I think it's of course it's related with uh, all we have said of eternity life and um, yes I don't know if I answer your question Milan. <laughs> <laughs> Milan, we can't we can't hear you because you're mute. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I kind of like disconnected. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh no! All of your response, so I'll just rewatch it. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, I was gonna, I was gonna say there's a you. It'll be on YouTube later, so you you can you can see yourself uh -huh. disappearing, but then you know, uh -huh. you'll be able to hear Glenn, <laughs> Glenn just respond. No worries, it's all good. It's you know, okay. it's all new to us. No worries. So that's fine. It's fine. Is a technology. Uh, Daniel, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I was actually also curious about your um, study of classical ballet and how it impacted your work. But since you already covered that, I think um, I'm also curious about how um, now that you have to basically change this work to an online format on a typically much smaller screens. Um, how is that going to affect how you think about future work? Mm, good question. Well, classical ballet, uh, I, I said that I think it influenced in the rhythm uh, of editing and, um, and, uh, and I think at the beginning I used my body also as well without any uh, problem. I had no problem to, 
to you know but one of them is not i encourage you to see the other one the first reading is not the the first reading video is not on on the project but it's on my website and also on youtube and it's myself reading that was in 2003 i was laying very young like your age <laughs> um in the in the grass with the sea and the in havana behind you know it was very very i believe very uh and, and i had a flower dress and with age reading one flower was growing one of the dress one of the flowers dress was starting to grow from from you know to to take like life with the stem and everything so uh, that was the first reading video and so i was there you know without no problem i think it's also because i pre i presented myself so many times in the public in a wider public so i had no no shame <laughs> so and uh and in other videos, I use my body, my body as well. And uh, for the second question, uh, what was it? Um, how has, like, had having to transfer these videos online, how is that going to affect your future work? Thank you. Yes, uh, I've been thinking a lot about it. And there are many questions, of, issues of in, in that. Uh, one of them is the, it's not the most important one, but it's one of, one, one of them is the commercial one, because when, a collector has a video you are giving them a certificate saying that he has one of five so he doesn't want to see a lot of people having it because they just download it from internet so what do you do with that that's very so what i've done is a watermark but sometimes you know watermark is maybe annoying for a lot of people because that that's not the work actually the work it was not done with that one so that's something that that worries me a little bit there but the solution for the moment is the watermark but i know it's not gonna be forever and the other thing is that worries me is that when you go to a museum or a gallery you have the the quietness you have the conditions created perfectly for that and sometimes i mean if you are an art connoisseur if you know art then you will create yourself your your own because you maybe stay in the room with your headphones on and hear it. But most of people, maybe, they are, they let me watch this so they don't put their head, their heads, they don't put the volume, which is a very part of my videos are the volume, are the sound, I'm sorry. So if they see it without the sound, if they see it without the breathing sound, what is, you know, that's not my work either. So that worries me, but maybe this is also, uh, uh, can, be, uh, can be solved with the, with the sign, please put the headphones on and things like that. So they're kind of issues that I think is just readapting it, but uh, I, 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 don't, I don't have a, like a very, you know, radical position. No, I don't, I don't like, one of the, you know, proof is, is shown that it's completely online. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Okay, I guess I'm the last one. Uh, <laughs> can you hear me okay? She, yes. Okay. Uh, you kind of already covered most of my questions such as materials and how music influences your art. Um, would you please talk about your working process? Like, do you have an idea first, then work towards the idea? Or do you just start working and let the idea and the can content to show up later? Good question too. Well, all the questions are being great. You are very smart students. <laughs> um, no, the, the, the ideas comes uh, before. I never get to work with, uh, I hate that. I, mean, yeah, I, know, I know I respect people who do it. They have actually, I admire them because they have a talent for that, but I don't have that talent. I need to have an idea very clear. And after I have that idea, then I put myself to work. And actually, I sometimes wait till I digest that idea because maybe it's not so good as I thought in the, from the beginning. So I prefer to leave it like rest and, and see it and, and, and I question it and I like see it from different points of view. For me, I visualize it like that. I have this idea, and then I start, first of all, question, which is the medium? Is this good for video? Is this good for drawing? Is this good for painting? Blah, blah, blah. After I finish that, so that first question, then I start to see it from different points of view. 
and I like the worst critics in the world. I am my worst critic or my hardest critic. critic. So that's the, that's what I, and which is true. While I'm doing some work during the process, I have new ideas because in the process is true. I see, oh, this might be this, uh, this shape of, wow, this is, can be this and that, but it happens too. This is very interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. This, this has been great. These have been great questions. I guess, I don't know if Taras wants to ask something or people from uh, the audience, I think. We yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll open it up first now yeah. to um, anybody who's in the audience who would like to ask a question. Um, you can do so two ways. You can either, you know, um, uh, send me a chat, you know, or a chat to everybody and just ask Glenda that way and we'll monitor it and, and, and ask her to answer it. Or if you want, you can, you know, unmute yourself and, and ask a question. Um, um, I guess be, um, while, while we're waiting, you know, for, for some uh, messages to come through, um, I think it, it's important to kind of take a step back and um, maybe for both Patricia and I to explain a little bit about the process of developing a show like this that's to be viewed exclusively online because, and Glenda, feel, feel free to jump in here, you know, um, from, from a creative perspective, um, but these these works were not created for tablets, for smart devices, for shows. These were made to be projected, you know, on, onto, you know, walls in the gallery as, as kind of immersive environments also, or cinematic or film experiences. And, you know, um, you were kind enough to allow us to do this because, you know, I, I think the moment was, was you know, um, right to, to do something like this. But um, in reality, uh, we, we really wanted to create an exhibition that as best as possible allowed you to experience these works, you know, as close to the, you know, being in an actual gallery environment. That's why we, you know, we, we, re we recommend that if people are going to watch these shows that, you know, they turn their lights off, you know, that they do stream it on, you know, as large of a format as, as possible, you know, as, as a TV and, you know, have, have kind of the, the volume up a little bit. Only then can you really kind of get as close to the artist's vision for these works as possible. But, you know, again, we, we are in a pandemic and so um, we have to kind of make, make adjustments. But uh, um, I think that overall the, the process was successful. I mean, yeah, and I'll open up, up to the students because I think, and also to Glenda, um, in terms of, you know, how, how have you received the work, you know, no, knowing what I just kind of mentioned, that it's really meant for a gallery setting, but, you know, um, the exhibition is kind of organized as, as, as a response to viewing work during a pandemic. Um, you know, anybody can chime in on this. No, yeah. I, I, yeah, I totally did get that sense um, that it was supposed to be kind of this submersive, um, this immersive um, kind of experience. And um, especially with the breathing portion, because I really liked that, um, that half of the exhibit. Um, with the, I guess, the time constraint of the video kind of like limits it in a way, because instead of me, I normally I would picture myself just sitting at the the gallery or exhibition and just like sit there for minutes and just watch the video on loop and breathe and breathe and breathe and breathe. Um, so I think that aspect of it was limited as well as the the immersiveness of I guess the visuals of just the earth coming towards you and moving away. I think would it's is greatly affected by that. Um, but I guess like he, this kind of was answered already, but like, w would there be anything, I guess, um, content wise, would you change with your um, exhibition knowing that if you had foreseen the pandemic, um, would you change anything, I guess, content wise, rather than 
formally? Uh, no, content-wide, um, for me it's difficult because I think, uh, because I've, what I feel with the pandemic is that I was already dealing with some issues that now are becoming more, you know, actual, more strong. So what I would do with, with them is kind of continue, continue with this, this um, you know, uh, with this, because uh, I think it's even more necessary now. But... Uh, Right now, I am uh, creating, but formally, I'm creating an interactive, um, I'm about to create an interactive um, kind of program uh, for, um, for uh, Grand Central Arts in Santa Ana. They, uh, they also were inviting me to have a residency in the summer, but I cannot go, of course, and instead they are telling me, well, let's do something online but something especially for, for the format. So I will, I'm creating that and I will let you know. And I, I think, it, but no, for the theme, I think it's uh, the, the content. I think, uh, no, I will keep with this, with the nature, with the sound, with the, but of course, maybe now we are experiencing, maybe I have some ideas of these times after, after it happens. So right now we are so much into it that I, I don't feel like I'm doing, I don't think I'm doing something about the, the situation now but maybe in the future um can i just yeah. say something no i because i saw uh that ra's uh question was important in terms of you know explaining a little bit you know how was that this came about and well you know the the pandemic was happening and the gallery the art gallery in fact adjusted very quickly to the online situation and Taraz did a, an amazing um, job at putting together an exhibition as soon as this started. It's called, it was called Play and, Play and Pause. And we, you know, as we were transitioning, Taraz had told me, you know, what, what, what else can we do to keep this, uh, to keep the gallery running and to keep people engaging with art. And so she, he threw that to me and I started thinking and looking at different artists, not only Cuban artists, but a different variety of, of artists and specifically video art. And when I saw uh, Glenda's videos, of course, I was uh, shocked by the relevance of, of the themes in connection to our moment. And one thing I will say about um, this, this concern with the, with the difference between being in a gallery and being in a phone, I mean, you know, I, I, we, will, we, we know very well the limitations of having to watch these things on a phone or in a computer or during, with, with uh, daylight. This is not, we're not trying, we're not trying to kind of reproduce an experience that cannot be reproduced, which is that of being inside a gallery. Um, however, I, you know, because of my work at museums and thinking all the time about how we engage with art um, and how much time we spend with art, I, I, put it, I put it out there and think about how much time do we spend watching a video clip or how much time we spend in front of a TV, right? Uh, watching something and or the TV is in the background or these things are happening. And what I found fascinating was the duration of these videos and the simplicity and the kind of intensity that they had. And that I saw was what, uh, what was kind of, what I wanted to rescue in terms of how we engage with, with, with this um, gadgets today and how we watch things, right? And so in a way, create, use these videos that Glenda created to um, being in the, uh, being in, in, in isolation or, or being in confinement, uh, a kind of a different way to connect uh, with, our, uh, with our, our, our media, with media in general. Thank you. Thank you for that, Patrice. I, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> that was very good. Um, I'm going to jump in now because I did get um, a question. Um, and this is from Michelle, um, who said that this is a fantastic conversation. Thank you, Michelle. We're glad you liked it. Um, and um, the question to Glenda is, um, um, given Glenda's history in working in collaboration with other artists, 
how has that idea continued in her work? We can talk a little bit about collaborating, you know, with, with, with artists. Yes, I, I have to say that I never collaborated again with mm -hmm. other artists since I was uh, a student. Well, not never. I collaborated with a choreographer, actually, and with musicians. That's true. That's true. But uh, especially with visual artists, specifically with visual artists, not anymore. But my, my recently have done uh, a concert, which I encourage you to watch it online on YouTube. It's, it's great. Uh, a musician, a pianist, wonderful jazz pianist in, from Cuba, interpreted my musical, my visual musical scores that I've been doing for years in a concert, in a, in a theater, given Havana Biennial in 2015. And it was beautiful. Uh, that was a beautiful collaboration. And recently, uh, this year still, I think it was this year, yeah, before the pandemic, <laughs> just before, uh, there was a premiere of, uh, of, our, of a dance uh, choreography uh, from a Brazilian uh, choreographer uh, with the company, a uh, Cuban company, Carlos Acosta Danza. And I did, uh, I was called to make the, 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 cost, the costumes, no, the vestuary. And, uh, and the, and the uh, set, the set design, which was really a great experience. So I tried, it was uh, after Havana, it traveled to Royal Opera. So I traveled there and watched it in the Royal Opera of London, which is, I mean, not in the main theater, but in the small theater they have, but it was still very, 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 uh, very so, And I want to keep doing these, these things. It's very interesting because actually you're not your, the, your own boss anymore. You have to work for a whole completely, you know, a whole team, and and the boss is is the choreographer, <laughs> or the or in the case of the musician, we were both uh, the same. But also, uh, I think collaborative it can be called to the public when interactive works are done. The public is doing the the work, which is the case uh, of the pool between Havana Havana and Miami. I did it in two thousand nine, so people were 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 swimming from. Uh, Havana to Miami in a pool, in a way. So you have to see it online for understanding the images. So that was, I was nervous because I didn't know what the people were going to do, if they were going to swim, if they were going to jump to the pool or not. And I call a DJ and so it was, it was great. I, I, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have one question uh, from Gerardo. Hi, Gerardo, who was, uh, was here with us today and was very kind to write uh, a wonderful text um, within the context of the exhibition. It's in Spanish, but it was, um, it was just very, um, it, it kind of invited us to reflect on um, the, the political implications of Glenda's work uh, but from a position that is um, kind of opens up a little bit the question of, of the political itself. And I'm just going to read his question. It's a little long, but I think it's, it's a great question. And it says, in a moment of highly ideological and hyper-political discourse in all spheres of social life, and especially museums and contemporary art, art at large, uh, it seems to me that Glenda's work is doing something else with politics. It is inviting to an exodus of some sort instead of asking spectators and subjects to act, subjecting them to militant practice. I think this is a breath of fresh air. Glenda, do you consider your work intervening in this politics or rather uh, effectuating an exit from politics, perhaps a new poetics? Um, thank you, Gerardo, for your question. So, Still, yeah, do you? Yes, uh, yes, of course. Um, uh, it's very interesting, that question, yes, because, because people sometimes when see my work say, oh, this is escapist, or this, is, this is not dealing with the reality. And uh, very, because as a Cuban, I have experienced um, so many, you know, issues that I could just put on and uh, be and become very interesting for the media and for the public because it's nothing more more um, 
uh, spicy for curators and lecturers that come to Cuba is that criticizing Cuban government and criticizing Cuban society, Cuban politics. But you know, the thing is, if you, it's so easy. That's so easy. And when you experience and you are victim of the situation of a certain political state, uh, certain political systems, well, if you are a victim of it, you don't want to deal with it anymore. You want to go over it. You know, it's kind of, I like the word healing because I think my word is about healing this. And it's about going beyond, not staying in the front, not staying in the back, you know, going beyond, recognizing that there is, that there is uh, a problem here, but, but going to the solution, not staying with the problem. And the solution, I think for me, is inside of each individual. It's not because the change, the first change is in between us, is inside of us. So, um, of course, there are many things that have to be done and manifest and protest and so on, but I want, I prefer to do something else. Because I myself, for example, that comes probably from a very personal thing. I don't like mass, massive amounts of people. I myself, I cannot, since it's small, now since I was child, I cannot be together with a long, a big mass of people because I cannot breathe actually. <laughs> so I start to feel, you know, so since then I, I was really clear with my mom. I, she said I she was, it was really, really, I don't take me to this kind of places anymore. <laughs> I asked her when I was still with it. So because of that, I think there are other ways to manifest. There are other ways to protest and there are other ways to speak up and uh, and I think uh, what I try to achieve in my work is to change the, the people, to change the way you, you act and the way you behave, you interact with nature and your surrounding. I think it is very political. Actually, yeah, there is a, there, there is a, a, a woman, I have, I forgot her name, but I will, I will come up uh, that she say a sentence very, very, Beautiful that love is completely political. It is profoundly political. I I would I would tell but you were going to say Patricia. No, no, no. I was just going to go up what you were saying about um, this uh, this connection with nature and just to kind of build on um, head out of those question. Uh, that I saw one of the things that I thought about your work that I was excited about was that we could use it as a way to refer to reflect about our current situation in very in many different uh capacities or through the all the all the various implications that it has and i hear what would like to rescue glenda something that you said earlier which is how you work with a butterfly to think about the micro and the macro and I think that's very relevant and we can think about Gerardo's question in terms of, you know, uh, how can we think about the way that art really engages with politics and, and with the political as, uh, as, as a kind of um, uh, multi-lens or a more complex uh, way. And not only in terms of um, uh, finding finding subject positions or addressing particular subject positions, but in fact creating experiences or conveying experiences that address something that concerns us all and that implicates us all. And I think that's very valuable because right now we might be having conversations uh, in different places or at different, and I think it's important that if we could uh, have uh, this rather more uh, relational or more, um, um, I don't know, like a, like a larger kind of uh, context to speak about, to talk about these things. And I think the experiences that you bring about, Glenda, and the way that you work in this intensity is one way that I thought could be productive. Yeah, I think as soon as you change the way people look at reality, you're making politics. Because politics come from, from the people who lives in a city, so that's a, this is, um, yes. So if you change that, and the, the sentence I found it, I, I posted in my Instagram once, and it said, love is profoundly political. Our deepest revolution will come when we understand this truth. It's Ben Hooks who said that. 
So it's an American activist, a female activist. So, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. You can finish. Sorry, I was going to know. I wasn't no, sure. No, no, I was, I was finished. Yeah. Um, I, I really like it when, when people, um, you know, kind of bring up the idea of politics, especially as it pertains to art. Um, because, you know, generally speaking, um, every action, you know, and I, and I tell this to students a lot, um, is, is every action in one way or another will be perceived politically. You know, this, the fact that I made a decision to drink out of this cup as opposed to, to be political for, for somebody. Um, but I think that it's important to draw a distinction, it, it, at least from a curator's perspective, um, there's, I draw a distinction between um, something that's political as opposed to politicking, you know, because something that is political, um, it is, of course, uh, some type of a gesture that has numerous entry points by which it can be interpreted in the positive and in the negative. To politic means to, to kind of plant a flag into the ground and say, this is what it is. You know, it is to voice the, a type of ideology. You know what I mean? And you have art forms and genres and networks um, and, and social relations and visual culture that operate in, in both realms, you know what I mean? And I see that your your work is way more, it, it, you know, it's political in the sense that it's, 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 it's you know, um, you, people will often bring their own baggage and see what they want to see sometimes and what, you know, an artist is, is trying to kind of, you know, present. But in both cases, they're still very much open-ended with, with flexibility or ambiguity and, and interpretation. But you're definitely not politicking, you know. You're definitely not saying this is what it is, and it can only be this way, you know. Um, but you correct me if I'm wrong, or you can build off of what I just said. Yeah. No, completely. And one, it's, it's like that. And, and one another issue that uh, is that when you that I always like to to say is when you watch the sky, the staring eye, and you feel like, wow, how beautiful. You don't see how beautifully uh, democratic sky is this or how beautifully republican is this sky or how socialist or how capitalist it's not that that doesn't exist in nature and we are beyond that we are human beings so i wanted to focus on what is human and what is essential because politics is very very it comes and goes and it's you know it's gonna change if you see a, a time lapse of the of the world map politically arranged you know, it's, it's kind of, it shapes a lot, like uh, this was uh, this country before, this was another one, and, and this, is, this is changing a lot. So it's not forever, and I'm sure, I hope maybe one day it will end up on this kind of uh, polarizing or, you know, it's kind of uh, silly too, because, you know, I don't, don't want to say silly, but uh, I, don't, I think in the future this will also disappear, and that we are kind of watching it already falling, you know, apart. The, the uh, you know, what, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. I think it's, it's very obvious. Great. Well, with that, I'm, I'm looking at the time and it's, you know, it's 11.19 right now. And I think we, we had a really, really great exchange, you know, and um, <laughs> I think this is kind of a good time to, to end the, the conversation. But I want to thank, again, Glenda for, for taking the time. I know you're several hours ahead of us um, in Madrid, mm -hmm. and we really appreciate your being here today, as well as um, lending your works for the exhibition Breath and Delirium, which um, closes in two weeks um, from today on, on uh, September 25th. So um, please, you know, in, enjoy it while you can. I want to thank uh, my colleague, Patricia Ortega Miranda, for, for you know, all her work on the exhibition, on working with the students and bringing them, you know, together and, and, and you know, having such a wonderful event. And then finally, I want to, you know, thank all, all the students. Um, I'm gonna go down the list here because you all deserve to be called out individually. Kira, Candice, Jasmine, Miguel, Milan, Danielle, and uh, Daitsa, is that right? Daitsa or Giazza? Um Thank you everybody for, for participating and for your, your very thoughtful comments. And then 
finally, I want to thank um, all our friends who, who joined us today who are not enrolled in the class, but are friends and supporters and interested in what the art gallery does. And um, we'll have more things um, throughout the academic year, more engagements with, with artists, um, more um, um, online exhibitions, and just, you know, the, the key thing I think we, we want people to, to get from this is that art matters no matter what situation we find ourselves. And um, if ever there was a time to make art, to support art, to support culture, now is the time because those are forms that bring us together and we definitely need that now more than ever. So um, thank you again to everybody and I wish everybody just a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.